welcome to the Business of Business podcast. In this episode, Lewis talks to Jeff Hare, CEO of ERP Risk Advisors. Jeff shares how organizations who are maintaining ERP applications are missing out on implementing good internal controls. Jeff also shares his personal experience with surviving a major heart attack and how his health actually saved his life. Enjoy. All right. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you very much for joining today. Um, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and then we'll get into some of the questions that I have. Um, So I am Jeff Hare. I am the CEO of ERP Risk Advisors. We are a small um, practice that specializes in IT security for Oracle applications, and that's what I do for for a living. Um, Apart from that, I'm a a, been married for 27 years to my my wife and we have three daughters uh the two that are in college and one that's in high school so i'm a little on the poor side right now on the, <laughs> on the college spending but uh life is good i can't complain <laughs> and um you're also involved with mis do you want to talk a little bit about that yeah so i have been teaching um on it security for about 15 years since in and around the time that uh, the Sox, sorry means oxley was passed in the u.s um, so I taught on my own for a long time. So part of what we did as a company was we still do is training. Um, I got picked up by MAS Training Institute as an instructor uh, December late 2013 was the first class I taught for them. So I've been teaching them, um, teaching with them for six years. And I teach two classes, one that focuses on um, Oracle e- eBusiness Suite and one that's uh, specifically for e- e- Oracle ERP Cloud or the Fusion applications. Okay. And so in your time with them, that's, that's primarily what you've done is the Oracle applications, right? Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, and then also uh, on your um, LinkedIn profile, it says that you're an Asaka, if I'm saying that right, reviewer. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, what work have you been doing with those guys? So they have peer reviews of articles. Um, I've written a couple of articles that have been published over the last 10 plus years. Um, I think three I've had published, um, maybe two, I can't remember exactly. I think it's three. And, uh, so they have all those articles are peer reviewed and you sign up as a volunteer. So they'd look for, you know, kind of experts in different areas of the, of the industry. And then we rate those and give our opinion on whether they should be published and that kind of thing. But I've been doing that for a long time as well. Right. Okay. Um, keeps me current on what's going on in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll come back to some of these other, um, to a second and MIS perhaps a little bit later on, but going further back in your past, you've been a controller and a CFO, right? Can you talk to that a little bit? So I started my career in public accounting. So I had a couple of years um, with what was Coopers and Libran, um, it's now PwC, and uh, then moved into CFO and controller roles. Um, kind of had a fit, felt like that uh, public accounting wasn't the thing for me. And so I worked as assistant controller um, uh, moved up to controller then CFO eventually for a privately held company, um, right. that does, uh, still does uh, mining construction equipment in the Phoenix area. Um, left there, um, worked for a publicly traded company insight, right. um, which is a competitor to CDW. A lot of people know CDW now, maybe not as much insight, but, um, and that's where I got my first introduction. So I was, uh, stepping back. I was hired to do, uh, U S divisional public, uh, U S divisional controller, um, for a publicly traded company. And uh, boss says, first day, oh, by the way, we're implementing this thing called Oracle. That'll be your responsibility as well. So lo and behold, that uh, one comment made a big shift in my career. And I've been working in the Oracle application space since about late 1997. Okay. Okay. So um, from there then, what got you shifting from the CFO role into internal controls? Was it well, where was the jump? Was it a gradual thing or was it something that kind of happened overnight? So I left um, Insight in 1999 and started doing um, basically system integrator work. So I was implementing the applications um, for clients, mostly on an independent contractor basis. And as I implemented the applications, um, looking at kind of like the way the applications are used and implemented the deficient, what I would call some of the, the uh, Oracle like doesn't like me to say deficiencies, but deficiencies in the way the application was designed, or the way that the applications are designed, leading to some challenges in in control design. 
Um, it really started, uh, moved into what, what we would think of today as the GRC or internal controls and security space um, in around the, the Sarbanes-Oxley timeframe. Okay. Um, so I was doing pure SI work at the time, um, implementing kind of the core financials modules and uh, wrote my first white paper. I, I can remember it. I was living in Phoenix at the time. It was called um, Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, I thought I remembered it. Something, Sarbanes-Oxley in your control environment. Yeah. Um, and then I, I fl- actually flew to Seattle to pitch it. Um, so I got accepted as a local regional um, OUG and, and then presented that paper. And then I kind of wanted to see, like, do I know something that people are interested in hearing? Yeah. Do I have something of value to add to them? And that kind of gave me the uh, impetus, I guess, or the, the the confidence that there was some 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 space for training and some certainly some consulting. Yeah. So going back going back to then Sarbanes Oxley. Um, I felt at the time that companies were throwing money at it. Was that something that you experienced back then? Well, there was a lot of confusion as to what it meant. And so uh, throwing money at it is, is a good is a good way of looking at it because they didn't weren't exactly sure what, what this was going to entail for them internally. So there was a lot of money being thrown at it. And there still is a lot of money being thrown at it, uh, yeah. I could argue. Um, but... Um, yeah, I think early on it was just a confusion of what does this mean and what is it going to look like and over scoping, under scoping. I think scoping and 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 coming coming to a risk based conclusion on what should be in, included is still a big challenge for organizations. Yeah, you you mentioned there still. So what, what's what's changed and how is it still the same today when you're working with companies? Um, gosh, uh, so there's there's a lot of interesting challenges i think in the industry as a whole um that have never really been solved and uh so one of them is kind of the way the system integrators implement the applications leading to incomplete control design as part of the implementation um and then in the audit community there is there's a gap um between you have the functional auditors and the it auditors and there's a gap that kind of exists between the two and it's it's an extremely important gap it's really in and around application controls Right. And um, yeah, so that 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 has never really been solved. It's um, and then there's there's part of part of the issue with the audit industry as a whole is, um, you know, the, the knowledge that the external auditors have isn't perfect. Um, sometimes it's not risk based. Sometimes they under scope some areas that should be scoped in, in my opinion. Right. And um, they have this, you know, relationships with customers or clients that, of theirs and their and uh, what wasn't a risk last year. Now they want to introduce as a risk this year and how not only that impacts the relationship with their clients, but also then the PCOB would look at that. Like, why didn't you audit against this last year? Why, why is all of a sudden this an issue? And it's, it's kind of like the, the elephant in the room, um, for the audit community. Yeah. Um, and I've had the privilege of, uh, of, of training both the PCOB and a couple external audit firms, um, over the last, you know, five or five, well, five plus years. Um, and it's given me some interesting insight that I think that uh, me being an outsider really to the, both the internal audit community and the external audit community, um, can critique, you know, some of the, the challenges that are still faced by organizations, yeah. um, as a true independent voice. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you talked there about the, um, the fear of introducing, you know, new risk analysis. Um, how have how have companies gotten over that? Because obviously, saving face is not really an excuse for kind of ignoring, like you say, the elephant in the room. Um, so how are how are companies getting over that when they when they find something new and it's like, oh yeah, we perhaps should have looked at this last year. Uh, it's a bit embarrassing, but I suppose embarrassing is better than suffering. Um, so what a what a um, how have you found people have gotten over it, or is it are they just more happy to just leave it out, leave these things out? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. Um, the when we're engaged with clients and um, we are introducing risk to them that perhaps we think should be in scope from a SOX perspective, um, that puts management in a position. Sometimes management, I mean, in theory, um, they should they need to take action upon that. And they and say sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. 
Um, sometimes they look for or try to implement mitigating controls. So part of what we, we would do is, you know, try to put some technologies in to monitor what they're doing. So it's a variety of things on the management side. Um, it becomes even a bigger challenge um, on the external audit side. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I would say both of them, the, 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 the default approach to it is putting their head in the sand and, and kind of pretending that it didn't, that it didn't exist. Yeah. Um, and that, is an interesting position because you can argue that is really the antithesis of what the intention of SOX is, is transparency. And, you know, I mean, both management making their own assessment as well as the external auditors opining on um, the control environment. And um, that's not what investors are expecting. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see, um, do you see organizations taking more of a, Oh, I'm trying to think of the right term here, but historically working with you know certain organizations, everything they do is driven by you know a check mark in an audit, let's say. Are you seeing organizations change that stance to actually we just we want to protect our assets, protect our money, you know uh, make sure we're operating efficiently, all those kind of things out yeah, forget what an auditor's gonna say. These are just common sense risks that we want to try and, you know, overcome right. in order to, you know, make sure that our finances are in order and we're getting the best out of our systems and nobody's stealing from us. All those kind of good excuses. To me, they, that's common sense. But are organizations talking to you in that way or is it still very much like we just want to pass the audit? Um, so there's kind of two approaches. Um so management with integrity uh, would take the approach of we're always trying to do um, update a risk assessment on an annual basis to make sure we're not missing anything, including taking training or, you know, reading things in general. Um, so there is uh, organizations that do that proactively, and, I, and that's obviously the intention of the, the overall management risk assessment. So it comes down to character a lot of times. I mean, the, the, the podcast you did recently with the gentleman that um, – the whistleblower yeah. Um, when he's talking about, you know, people really sometimes don't want to know what they don't want to know what they don't know. Yeah. Um, and so they'd rather not do the right thing. They'd rather not have people internally um, uh, bring risk to their attention or, you know, manage an override of controls. I mean, a wide variety of things that, that really comes down to character and integrity. And um, if I'm on the board, the most important thing for me is to have transparency and character and integrity in my man, my senior management team. So there are cases where um, people are approaching us and I mean, uh, we're dealing with a publicly traded company now that saw one of my YouTube videos that I put up on a very obscure topic that most people wouldn't have any clue what it means. Yeah. And um, we're dropped, you know, they said, well, you know a lot about this one topic. So probably you can, you can come in and do an overall risk assessment and update what we're doing. Um, and give us some feedback on what other areas that we're missing. So yeah. that happens occasionally, um, but more often than not, we're waiting for, um, you know, the external auditors to come in and um, cast some sort of, <laughs> whether it's a material weakness or, or on the verge of a material weakness, you know, significant deficiency where they, they've, you know, allowed the, the client to skirt um, to, uh, I was use skeptical terms, and I apologize. <laughs> I, I'm a I'm a I'm a critic by nature, right? This is which makes me a good consultant. But um, sometimes I uh, I use uh, I don't give people the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> um, maybe it's because I've been in the industry for a while and and uh, and have seen the, the lack of evolution. But uh, so I apologize. Sometimes I use language that is um, a little critical of people's approach, and I should, uh, anyways. But there's a place for that, though, right? I mean, um, yeah, I, I can sort of see where you're coming from because there, and there is an association with auditors or those finding issues that they, you know, that, you know, arguably in their job, at least, forget personal life, you know, the, the role is to be a pessimist, right? Which is to err on right. the side of, you know, loss rather than, well, it might be okay. Right. So I, I understand where you're, where you're coming from. Um, and I think that lends itself to the fact that, what you do is much more deep dive into applications and perhaps a lot of the accounting firms would, would tackle. And I hear that from customers a lot as well. You know, we had the auditor in, you know, if they'd have found half the things that you found, um, 
you know, we'd all be we'd all be in trouble or jail by now. You know, I've I've heard that before. So, so that kind of critical yeah. thinking is 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 um has its place, as I say. I think so. But I'll I'll let you continue. You were, you were saying that um that that what you're what you're you know what you're doing with customers is trying to get them to think like that at least in this context, right? Which is to think the worst case scenario, I suppose. Yeah, so I think that the the the, the one universal um, common thread across all customers is uh, they're they're uh, opposed to you know opposed to allowing fraud in their organization. So that's that's universal uh, across all organizations. And so um, the ACFE has a, the report that I'm sure you and your listeners are aware of the the report to the nation that comes out every couple of years. And um, you know it's amazing to me um, if you quantify that for most organizations how significant that fraud is. Uh, so a lot of, uh, I was just talking to a customer this morning and they're and uh, or a prospect and they're asking, you know, they're not, they're not a strict SOX filer, um, but they are saying we're, uh, and management is taking approach, a, a very um, not risk averse approach to be able to implement a system. And they said, where, where should we start? Because yeah. we don't have the, the, the leverage or the hammer of the external auditors giving them a tier weakness. And I said, start with P2P fraud. Um, so there's, there's fraud, there's, I, I believe significant fraud risk in the design of the applications, um, in every organization. And, and I have, uh, in our approach and engagements is whether we're asked to, to opine on that or not, I look at it, right. um, because it's, it's an area of risk that we can add value to the organization and, and generally, um, it, uh, it, it crosses, you know, um, all, all organizations exactly the same. Yeah. Um, you get to the, the right level of an organization, whether it's the CIO, CISO, or a CFO, and you present certain things to them and they're like, okay, yeah, I get it. I understand it. And we're, we're going to take action. And those are tangible risks, um, versus, you know, some would argue on the, on the, uh, on the public company side, the, the, the Sarbanes-Oxley side that we're dealing with, um, not tangible risks or dealing with, um, um, more um, textbook style. I, I forget the word I'm looking for, but right now, but um, they're not as practical uh, of a risk. You know, if a if a journal entry isn't approved and it wasn't you know documented specifically, it's approved. Is that really risk to the organization? No, it's really you know um, a documentary risk, so to speak. So yeah. Um, but I think that you know back to. All the organizations that we interact with appreciate the feedback on the on the P2P fraud risks, and there's yep. there's that's not. If you look at the ACFE report, that's not all encompassing of all the risks, but that is, you know, the the rev rec risks, revenue recognition risks, um, which is also part of the ACFE. That sometimes those are just um, timing issues rather than you know natural re recognition. Most of them really are timing issues. I'm, I'm recording revenue in the wrong period. Yeah. Uh, versus P2P is money's lot left the building, and um, there is inherently um, a lot of I, I would say every organization we've been in there hasn't been one organization we've done some work on on the P2P side but we haven't found something that management needs to work on. Right. Have you ever um have you ever worked with a customer? I'm always intrigued by this. Have you ever worked with a customer, and uh, you've uncovered something, you know, something not something that could happen, but something that is happening as a result of your work, you know, your fraud or theft or whatever you um, want to call it. But have so, you ever been involved in yeah, that so in that kind of process? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, the answer is no, actually. Um, it's interesting that we haven't, as part of our work, come across something that, I mean, there's there's always unauthorized access. Yeah. But um, whether they, well, we're often not asked to quantify that as part of an engagement. Um, so usually what we're, the flip side is, is there has been fraud committed now, come in and help us understand what vulnerabilities exist above and beyond um okay the areas of fraud that have been committed and how do we plug the gaps yeah uh but uh yeah we've we've been brought in right after the fact i mean you know some really weird scenarios and some significant fraud conditions and it's always interesting because you learn something new and the mind of a fraudster um never ceases to amaze me really yeah <laughs> what like what what kind of what what have you seen well, I mean, it's some things you think of, like, why, did, I mean, the way you implemented the system or the control. Um, so we had a, an example recently of a, of a company where 
um, a buyer was ordering um, some goods and then receiving those goods, which typically buyers can't receive goods. Right. They were shipping them to a, a, a somebody that was they were colluding with. And that same person that took those goods then sold those back to the organization. Okay. So the organization is paying for them once legitimately, and then they're paying for it a second time. And um, so this was a, an interesting scenario where it was a zero dollar. It was a it was a penny, um, penny item, and so they had a, a, a cost variance between the invoice and the and the PO. And the buyer was the one that got to override the cost variance. Right. Okay. So there was multiple controls in that scenario where I'm like, uh, one of the two of these things, these things should have caught the scenario and it yeah. went on for a couple of years and it was, they're estimating, you know, million plus, maybe as much as $2 million in fraud committed. And, um, we had, a, another publicly traded company, um, had a, uh, a fictitious letter sent to them saying our, uh, our bank account changed, right. look legitimate. They processed it without verify, verifying or validating the authenticity of the letter. And it was a $250,000, um, fraud scenario that was cash out the door as well. Yeah. So, um, that, you know, that the, one seems to be getting more prevalent, um, impersonation, supplier yeah. impersonation, yeah. um, yeah. and requesting for transfer of funds that, that one, there's been a few in the press on that one, but that seems to be increasing a uh, pretty bold move. That one pretty, pretty easy to, to, <laughs> to do too, just given the fact that all you have to do is develop some, I mean, there's, there's a lot of those, there's so much on the P2P side, just in and around managing supplier master. Um, and there's, we have a kind of a structured process. We, we take customers through on that side right? and, um, every ERP system, every organization is really, cause what I just, ex what it's just explained had nothing to do with the ERP system. It's agnostic. Yeah. It was something that happened completely outside the system. So we always say fraud begins prior to what happens in the system. And then you have to talk about what happens within the system. And then there's processes that happen after the system. Yeah. All that has to be. And this, I'll just take an example. That is, that is um, in the realm of internal auditors, that is two sets of skill sets. You right. have the yeah. process auditors, which look at the manual mitigating controls before and after the system, and sometimes like reconciliations. And then the IT auditors, and there's a gap that exists. The, it's really a communication gap is what it is. Right. Um, and if they would just do a better job of, um, of working through the audit together, they would see it from all sides and, that rarely happens. So when you say communication problem, is that um, if we said, okay, there are processes before the system, there are processes within a system and then after the system, what you're saying is that the parties involved in the application have trouble communicating what they're finding with those prior to the system because neither of them speak the same language. Is that what you're saying? Part of it is a language issue. Um, so an IT auditor you know, is not somebody that understands business processes and what happens, you know, in manual processes outside the system. Um, but often those audits don't happen at the same time, or they sometimes don't happen at the same time. So you're not looking at holistically. Yeah. So it was interesting when the, the, the concept of an integrated audit came out, which is um, in an external audit community, combining your financial statement audit and your SOX audit in, a, in an integrated fashion. Okay. Um, when I heard that first term, I'm like, oh, this is integrated audit means... IT auditors and functional auditors are going to audit the systems in a holistic fashion together. Right. You know, and, um, you know, I've had every time I go through this, some of these scenarios, um, in my training classes, I get reaffirmed. The internal auditors are like, yeah, I understand. And I agree. I'm just not quite sure how to solve it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it leaves a gap, uh, leaves a gap for organizations. And that's definitely an area where, where we, um, we thrive, um, working with customers on. Yeah. Now we've um we've talked a lot about um socks and I guess as a result primarily companies here in the U.S. But you've been doing a lot of work in the Middle East. So um, what's driving things over there? What what's been the calling over there? Um, I think that the it's really back to data security and fraud as well. I mean, there's an, there's a I think uh, a desire of organizations on a global basis to say we're, we're at the same level of excellence as what, or what they perceive as excellence right. from a, from a data security, from a fraud, from a internal controls perspective, they want to be the same as the best in the world. So, yeah. um, I think it's not driven by, it is a, is, it is a desire for management to do the right thing. Okay. Um, which I appreciate that perspective, um, coming, 
it's um, it, there's def de definitely different challenges, you know, when you're dealing with what we would think of as more emerging market companies, countries. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like I said, in the U S there's a lot, there's a lot of challenges facing highly, what we think of as highly mature organizations and yeah. those gaps aren't being closed either. So, so in the Middle East, there's no regulation driving this. Cause I, I'm, I was just curious as to why now, or maybe it's all, maybe it's always been this way. Have you always had, um, have you always been out with the companies in the Middle East or is that something in recent times? Um, we've done a lot of training, um, over, over the years in different parts of the Middle East. And, um, it's the same, you know, internal audit organizations primarily trying to, to gather knowledge, to be able to, to test, uh, and evaluate their organizations, but more so on the, on the project side, the last few years. And I don't know, I, I can't predict, um, what's driven that, um, part of it is if I had to guess is, is finding the right resources for them to rely upon, to do the work. And, you know, there's the, the large organizations as well, the large consulting organizations, if you take the big four, for example, they have an IT audit practice and they have a functional audit practice and, you know, it's either one or the other. And yeah. on the IT audit side, people are are going after more, what we I would call more sexy topics like penetration testing and, um, you know, artificial intelligence and things that are more cutting edge technologies. And that's the, you know, the more cool place to be in the, in the, yeah. in the internal audit and IT audit community, but, um, the basic blocking and tackling in organizations protecting from P2P &P fraud, there's still lots of, uh, vulnerabilities there, I think across the world. Yeah. Always, it always struck, it has always struck me as being odd because as you say, vi you know, viruses, uh, penetration testing, I would always call these, these things really progressive in that tomorrow's new virus is something that you haven't accounted for today. But the way that you do procure to pay in an application is probably the same today as it will be 10 years from now if you're still on that application. Like, right. you know, that, you know, the funk, the core process of doing that is going to remain the same. And so therefore, it's not like you're constantly having to develop new solutions to counter the threat. It's the same right, process right. day in and day out. Right. So in theory, the the controls that go with it should be mature at this point, right? Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. And there's there's a book to be written <laughs> that I have, you know, in my mind I've written I mean I've said written I write it every time I have an engagement with a client on that area, but there's a there's a PDP best practices for all ERP systems book to be written and yeah. in theory this should be once and done because there's the design's the same. There are a, a, a few minor nuances for sure from um, application to application, but in general um, those should have been mature a long time ago. And the fact that that, that control or that series of controls related, it hasn't been mature. Yeah. And we see that different means there's dysfunction or lack of maturity in the industry as a whole. And it really starts from a system integrator perspective, how ERP systems are meant to be implemented or are, are practically implemented in today's world. And, um, that sets off, you know, um, um, a process that doesn't change until there's an external an external influence other usually it's not an external auditor usually it's an internal auditor that's probing at more detailed um an external auditor is going to look at things like budget to actual and yeah. a review of checks and some other things that um, are good mitigating controls from a SOX perspective but uh may not be the right control from a from a fraud perspective or what we call a submaterial fraud perspective yeah yeah you um you mentioned the word books there. Do you want, can we talk about the books that you've done so far? Where are we up to? You've done how many on e business e suite? Um, I've done three. Um, one is a is a rewrite of um of a, the first edition. So I've done a second edition book on that one. Um, okay. And uh, you know, I've written a lot of articles. I, to be honest, I I'm probably not going to write another book publicly. And right. and the reason for that is. Um, it empowers the external auditors to be able to um, beat up on their clients is really what it comes down to. So uh, it's int what, what's very interesting is I've written a lot of stuff over the last 15 years publicly, and some of it's not good and some of it's really good. And um, or some of it, you know, I've matured as time has gone on, yeah. as I've learned. And um, some of the stuff that, you know, I've written in the, and I've published in the in, published pub in the public domain, I would call it. Cause sometimes some, some things I push, I publish and I only share that with our clients, for example. Okay. Um, it's ha they haven't been, they haven't been consistently or widely adopted by the audit firms. Right. 
And that's to me the mystery is I've you know put several articles out there that are significant risks from both a fraud perspective and from a um, from a SOX audit perspective. And I'm like, if I was developing an audit plan and managing my firm, I would have whatever is publicly available. Yeah, I would have you know m- make sure it's accounted for. And it's shocking to me to be honest that that's not the case. Do you ever find out why? Do you ever find out why these things don't get picked up or? I mean, not just your stuff, but why new practices? Is it again the is it the lack of the lack of um, I would say talent, but perhaps we'll use that word. Um, is it the lack of focus on that area? Where, where do you think it comes from? Um, it's consistent across all firms, right? right? The big four, and then even the 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 tier two firms that do external audits, and even those that support from the external audits from internal audit perspective. So, um, I. Th- you know, I think it's really a focus on um, budgeting or billing clients and not focus enough on practice development and, you know, managing their audit plan. Um, I mean, I have no other reason to explain it, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm always curious. Um, so um, in your work with um, um, Oracle applications, what... Um, what was what sort of surprised you most about working with customers? What's been the things that, you know, like you say, you've been working with the applications for a long time and there's a, there's a thing that says, you know, never assume that everybody knows as much as you do, but what, what's the one thing that really surprises you when you, when you talk to customers? Is it a lack of education on, on a, on an application or is it the way they're using it? What, what's always the standout things that you kind of pick up? Um, I would say, uh, the, from a broad picture theme perspective, they place too much confidence in Oracle as a software company and they place too much confidence in their system integrator. Okay. So there's a, a a naivete, I think to say, you know, and it's the same as true with SAP or any other ERP system. If we buy this system, it's going to solve all of our problems. Right. And it's not that the system in and of itself is poorly designed. It's just that. Um, the approach that the system integrators take is only meeting business objectives or their operational objectives. And they're not also um, making sure management isn't making sure that part of the project is when they go live, it's a well-controlled system. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't blame that on, on Oracle or SAP or anybody else. They're providing um, a technology platform to implement some things. And there's definitely some things I would say, need to change within their platform to make the customer's job easier. Okay. But on the same, on the same hand, I mean, we're, this is 2019 now. I mean, I, I implemented my first ERP system as a client in 1997. ERP systems have been around since the early nineties and some people would say even the late eighties. So yeah. ERP systems have been around for a long time and they've been implemented a lot of times, a lot of organizations and what's shocking to me is as new ERP systems are being purchased and solution for the system integrator, the same old, same old is happening on the, the contract side. Yeah. So what happens is the customer needs to be aware that a system integrator is going to come with a certain scope and that scope isn't adequate to be able to, to properly manage the system in the long run. Okay. Um, so I would say that's the number one thing if I had to think about it is – is uh, there's not a, a holistic approach to projects. And once a project goes in, um, it's very difficult to find a budget to fix the issues that um, were apparent because of the project. Okay. So if I had to give that, that's, that's a consistent theme. I, I walk in and I say, the number one, number one recommendation is if you've, if you haven't gone live, you need to have a separate security and controls track Yeah. that independently, identifies um, and manages risk from the very beginning of the project and can also hold your system and or accountable for implementing the, the system properly. And there's some aspects that you wouldn't expect a system integrator to do. Like we don't like to have role design done. Controls design is not done by the system integrator for sure. Yeah. But um, you know, they're just trying to get system- it done quickly, right? Yeah. Well, and, and all system integrators are going to bid it that way. So if you put an RFP for a bid, and, and they're not going to say, well, they're not going to win a bid by saying we're going to make our bid 20% higher because 
you're not factoring in all the things you needed to be done. They're gonna they're gonna respond a bit exactly the way that it's written and 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 consistent with how other system managers are gonna do it, or they're gonna lose the bid. Yeah. Um, and management needs to recognize that the there if if there is a formal RFP process, how to put that together, and then in the response and evaluating, uh, making sure that they're getting everything that they expect and. You know, we just had a conversation today with a company that is using 100% seated roles going into production, and management feels comfortable with that. And the internal audit organization saying, "How do we counteract that?" Yeah. Um, and that's not unusual for management to say, "We're we, we feel comfortable with this is this is what Oracle's this is what the software company we think is telling them. This is what the system integrators are are saying. Why would we deviate from that?" And that's a there's a systemic bias in the industry that is driving um, a poorly implemented systems across the board, whether it's Oracle, SAP, or anything, anything else. So what you're saying there, just to back up a bit, you mentioned the seeded roles. So what you're saying for, for anybody who's listening who's not aware, these applications are delivered with job roles that allow me, you, to get into the system and create purchase orders or enter sales, that kind of thing. And what you're saying is, is that using the roles that are delivered with the application by the vendor, Oracle, SAP, whoever, is typically a bad choice as to build in your own from scratch, right? Or some other derivative of that. So can you Absolutely. talk, for, for those who don't know, can you talk to why that's a problem? Um, well, each system is going to be a little bit different, but inherently um, they're providing a platform of, uh, of suggestions on how roles are. And that may or may not be consistent with how an organization is defined their, you know, I mean, if you can imagine, you know, a small privately held mom and pop shop doing business in one, um, one state versus a multinational organization do business throughout the world with a complex back office, um, you know, uh, accounting and IT organization in India, h- how people do their jobs differs dramatically. And, yeah. and the nice thing about your ERP system is you, can design the application to fit kind of virtually almost any scenario of organization in the world. And, um, you know, the, the analogy I always use with, with, uh, with SAP versus Oracle, and this is a kind of a, a simplistic analogy is uh, SAP is a very German um, centric view of the world. And they're like, you need to, you know, you would do it my way in German yeah. and you need to adopt the processes we're defined because we're the application experts and Oracle has a, has a, uh, has a very open view of the world. So SAPs like McDonald's, you know, if you want a custom nice cheeseburger, it's going to be painful, but um, Oracle's like Burger King, you know, you right. order the drive through the expect full customization, German mentality versus an American mentality. Okay. And um, you know, the, 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 the responsibility of management is to take the application as it's presented and tailor it to their organization. And you can't do that without building custom roles. Yeah. Um, and certain, and certainly, people having the ability to do everything in a system. So seated users, elevated access or privileged, highly privileged access um, that has to be monitored or controlled. And that's what you get in most organizations is somebody has keys to the kingdom, both of the application tier, let alone the database tier for, for on-prem solutions. But um, if I had to say that uh, organization, whether your organization is private or public, you have P2P fraud risks that have to be built and analyzed um, from a controls perspective and, and those don't come out of the box. Yeah. You have to have somebody that walk you through those. So Im- even those controls in of themselves, the seated roles, the seated roles may have a combination of people that can do things that you wouldn't expect them to. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Um, I want to take a complete left turn here. Um, and talk about, um, is this perhaps I should have segued from our discussion about the Middle East, but, um, if you will, I, I want to go back to uh, March, and I noticed that you had this on your LinkedIn profile. Um, and perhaps just to go a bit, a, a bit back before that, we're actually going to get a little bit personal now. Um, you've been training um, for Ironman, Ironman events, right? H- how long have you been doing that? Um, I have been doing triathlons for 10 plus years. Actually, gosh, it's been 13 years. I can remember when I started in that I've been doing kind of long endurance stuff. Um, since, um, since I was in my mid thirties, I'm, I'm 50 now. So about 15 years. Okay. Okay. So you've been competing in triathlons and, um, and in March, was it of this year, 2019, you were 
you're in Oman, was that right? Yeah. Okay. And so can you talk us through uh, what happened while you were there? You you were at a customer site, were you? Yeah, I was at a customer site in, in Muscat, and uh, I had just finished a race in December, um, early December in the U.S., and, and had decided that a, a 70.3 is a half Ironman distance race, and I decided that I wanted to try my first um, my first full Ironman and uh, so um, I started looking at that, and and um, so it was November 2020 or 2019. This year was when I was going to do my first Ironman, and so I fly over to um, right right at the end of December, and I find out that uh, Oman has their first 70.3 event, so the first um, official half Ironman race. So I decided to do that as part of kind of my training for the full Ironman. And yeah, um, so the story I'm, I'm going to tell it two different ways. But I'm going to okay. tell it the way that I think it should be told. And I'm going to tell it the way my wife thinks it should be told. So what my wife would say is I had a heart attack while I was doing a triathlon. Okay. And that is an accurate statement. Um, um, what my, what I always say is, and when I asked my cardiologist, she said, you would have had a heart attack eventually. It just happened to happen as part of a triathlon. Okay. So I say that because it's important to know that my triathlon career is not over. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I had a, I had a, um, an, an event, um, a heart attack, uh, March 1st of 2019. Um, and the short version is, uh, of the story is I didn't know that I had a heart attack. I was, I was in the middle of the race. I stopped the race cause I wasn't feeling well, had no traditional symptoms of what you think of as cardiac arrest right. or, I mean, I didn't, you know, whatever. I mean, the traditional symptoms, the tingling of all this, but. Um, I thought I had a bad day the next day I woke up, I thought I had the flu. Right. Um, so I had, which flu symptoms can, you know, heart attack symptoms can manifest like a flu, like aching and that kind of thing. And, um, it makes I sense, but I wasn't aware the day of the race. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I didn't find out, um, I had the heart attack until I came back to the U S uh, seven and a half days later, I was in Oman. I, I flew to Qatar for some other work. Um, and then came back, um, seven and a half days after my event and, uh, had my, had an EKG and my doctor said, um, I cannot understand right now how you're walking around and frankly, how you're alive. Right. So, so you actually flew twice before. And I imagine the first flight was relatively short distance, but the second one was from the middle East back to the U S was that, yeah, di- yeah. and that was direct. Yeah. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was a hop, skip, and a jump. So three, at least three, <laughs> three flights. Seconds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, on the grand scale of things, what was it? A severe heart attack? I mean, I, I'm not overly familiar with uh, severity levels of of you know heart heart attacks. But where the doctor obviously said you you perhaps shouldn't be here, so I take it it was a fairly severe heart attack at that point. So there's three main arteries in your, um, in your heart that deliver, that take blood in and, and pump it back out to the rest of the body. And there's, uh, people, people will, would, the, the technical name is the left anterior descending, um, artery. People more commonly know it, know it as the widow maker. Um, right. typically if that, um, artery is blocked and blocked for, uh, uh, you know, really most people when it's blocked, go into cardiac arrest, arrest. Right. Um, it, it immediately blood stops flowing to the body. Oxygen stops flowing. And if, if you're not dealing with CPR and, um, you know, you're, there's a good chance you get like 15 minutes to live at most. Right. And so that was the artery that was blocked. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so the widow maker was blocked. And, um, in essence, the reason I survived was because of my training. Um, so, what, what I've learned through this process is that is in cases where there's blockages happening, it's not just in the heart, there's other part of the, it could be your leg, it could be your arm, where, there, where there's arteries that are delivering blood, bloods to different parts of your arteries or veins that are delivering blood to a different part of your body. Um, the body has the ability to compensate for by that um, and develop what are called collateral arteries, which are, which are basically smaller um, methods, tubes, if you will, that become they take a bigger role on, if right. you will. Yeah. Um, so in my case, um, I'm, you know, I've, I've told my story quite a bit and I've yet to find somebody else that has had a widowmaker blockage that led to that survived. And the, and the scenario that I led 
because of collateral arteries, but ultimately collateral arteries in a, in a simplistic sense are developed because of, um, exercise. Right. Okay. Uh, and there's, uh, there's some, some studies on that, but not a lot of, not a lot of research out there to be honest. So, so the argument is that perhaps you would have had a heart attack anyway, but actually your training allowed your body to better survive it when it did. Is that the argument? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yep. So, so I'm an advocate of training. This is back yeah. to my wife and I. Uh, I'm an advocate of ongoing training. Yeah. My wife was like, do you have to really train so hard and so yeah. often? <laughs> and I can appreciate that position yeah. from her as well, yeah. Well, I suppose the position, though, is that um, the heart attack didn't happen as a result of a poor lifestyle choice, arguably. It's not like you're you know, uh, well, obviously obese or any of the other uh, sort of external attributes you might associate with somebody who might have, um, right. you know, heart type issues. Uh, like say, you, you, you know, you do some pretty intense uh, uh, physical activity. So you're, you're not the model for a typical, like I say, someone you would judge to be uh, somebody who potentially right. be a victim of a heart attack. Right. Yeah, there's only uh, we don't have I don't have a lot of risk factors, and the uh, the one risk factor when it came down to it um, was um, was I was on testosterone therapy for a couple of years, um, and it's not unusual um, for people. I mean, I mean, I was in my late 40s at the time, late 40s, early 50s, for doctors to prescribe um, some testosterone therapy, and uh, my cardiologist and my endocrinologist kind of believe, and looking back, that that was a risk factor, okay. um, whether it was the risk factor or not, medicine is fairly imprecise, um, in diagnosis and, uh, it's hard to tell, but the, um, I just throw that out there because I think that people need to be, um, aware of the fact that it is a risk factor and, and, and we're, we're seeing a lot of, um, seeing a lot of people prescribe that so i think they need to be aware that that's uh it is okay. definitely a risk factor i mean the the, de the details when you go on it is it, it does say in the fine print that up to one percent of people can have a heart attack if they go on it and i'm like that's when i read that i'm like one percent <laughs> that's pretty low risk i mean i'm yeah. a risk guy right i can yeah. i mean that's not going to be me and you know whether that was the only thing or um it was just a contributing factor obviously i'm part of the one percent i guess so. yeah so what was it like when um, when the doctor told you? You know that I, I imagine usual things like disbelief. You know you're still walking around. You've been working for seven days, flu, and all that kind of thing. When did it really sort of start to sink in? Um, gosh, you know, <laughs> weeks later. Really? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean. It, for anybody that's been through an event like that, it, it is a life-changing experience. And um, I mean, that, that day, from that day to the time I got my treatment, which is I had two stents put in. Right. And and by and there's so many by grace of God things that happened, you know, as part of this. But um, my 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 uh, my blockage wasn't calcified, so instead of having to do open heart surgery, they were able to do stents. Right. And they did stents through the wrist as opposed to the groin. Um, you know, from the, from the time that my doctor said, I'm sitting in his office at nine 30 in the morning, he said, um, you've had a massive heart attack in the last whatever. And I'm like, okay, I know when that was now that you tell me that, yeah. um, less 10 hours later, I was rehabbed in essence. I had my, I went to the hospital. They put me through the, through the ringers and 10 hours later I had two stents put in and my, you know, my blockage was cured. Yeah. So it took a while to be honest, to, to, for it all to sink in. Um, and you know, I would say there's some element of disbelief. I'm like, I'm feeling better now. I'm like, did I really have a heart attack? <laughs> I did, you yeah. know, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, the emotional side of it's been a challenge over the last six, six months in particular. I'm, you know, I'm getting back to normal health in terms of exercise and yeah, still on some drugs, but yeah, it's, uh, it was a challenge to, to accept it. Kind of the, think the reality of it. It is, um, are you still at risk? Is there future risk now or where do you, where do you think you stand? Gosh, that, that's the million dollar question. I think right. is what it comes down to is, you know, um, part of interestingly enough, part of why I went on testosterone therapy was I thought it was helping me reduce my risk of heart, heart attack or heart disease. Okay. There's some research to set that says, if you're on the low end or the high end, um, it, you're at risk for heart for, uh, for heart, heart disease. And so I really primarily went on it because 
I thought it because my, my level was low and I thought I was doing the right thing by going on it. Um, so obviously that was, I think, wrong in yeah. the end if I look back on it. Um, and I was working with my primary care physician and, you know, um, when it comes down to it, um, I don't know that the medical community has enough expertise or knowledge to consistently identify what causes it. Yeah. Um, as much as they, you know, thankfully have, um, good methods of treating it when it happens. So the one thing I know for sure is, um, my collateral artery saved my life. And I'm going to do everything I can to continue to train consistently. So my collateral arteries will always be there yeah. if another event happens. But the nice thing about it, um, having gone through the, so they do a catheterization of the heart. They looked at everything and I've got one other vein that's, you know, not significant, but, um, or one of their arteries, sorry, one of my other three arteries has some blockage in it, but, um, you know, the worst one is done. So I'm hoping that you know, that, that I shouldn't have to have any other uh, treatment on that the rest of my life. The stent should stay. And, and hopefully I'll, I've made some adjustments, you know, yeah. dietary drug wise, some other things to be able to stop the blockage from growing. But yeah, it's uh that's the big question is what risk level, what risk level would you think you at? You're at yeah. Lewis. I don't know. Listening to this, I'm, I'm not sure whether I need to go and exercise. Me, but I've talked to guys that are, you know, I know somebody that's 20 that had a heart attack. I've known some in their late twenties that have had significant issues and that's, yeah. you know, there's uh, the, the diagnosis of issues is, is very imprecise. And if I knew the answer to that question, I would be doing everything I could to figure out how to, yeah. avoid it. other than I am, a, I am off of testosterone therapy. It's one choice I've made and I'm taking statins and some other things, but yeah. I've made, definitely made some adjustments, Yeah, but I can't quantify the risk, which is no, a little sure. frustrating for a guy that, <laughs> that, uh, is a, is a risk yeah. advisor. Well, I was just wondering if the doctors had kind of given you any, um, insight, but I, I'd like you to say, I suppose it's, it's kind of difficult. So, but, um, you, you mentioned going back over the last six months. So, so what, what has it been like, obviously physically, physical recovery, but psychologically, where, where has it kind of put you? Uh, um, was it one of those kind of like, um, you said life changing. So what, what, what do you mean by that? What's that, what's that been like? So physically I got into rehab right away, which is good. Um, and obviously it was restricted for a while and I've been kind of, you know, ramping up over, over the time frame uh, in a straight line almost. So drugs have backed off a little bit. My exercise has gotten longer and more intense. Um, I'm certainly not exactly where I was prior to the heart attack, but I'm, I'm feeling like I'm getting, you know, close and probably some of the inhibition is um, right now the challenges is, is is the drugs i'm still on so i'm on a couple of the drugs that are one is an interesting drug it, it, it slows the heart down um so it's kind of an amazing it's kind of like a governor on the heart right it's called a beta blocker okay uh, but emotionally um you know a lot of it has been spending more time with family um it's refocusing on my relationship with my wife and then um, I, I meet with three guys um, from church i meet with them just about every week we've been meeting yeah. for m multiple years and um it's been a big part of, uh, I mean, they brought things that have been pretty, you know, big life changing issues yeah. to the group. And so we've kind of shared those burdens together and that's been a, it's been a huge blessing for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's so an amazing it, story. It's been a, yeah. a roller coaster, let's just say, uh, from, of emotions. Yeah, I'd say, but, uh, going in the right direction, um, certain, um, do you, do you think, um, you mentioned like change relationship with family and your wife and that kind of thing. Is that, is that, that's kind of here to stay. It's you, you kind of reorganize your priorities you think now. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure that I think it's more of an appreciation that you yeah. always have that appreciation more than it is priorities and timing. I'm, I've always been, I would like to say I've always been very focused on family, um, both my, my wife and my three daughters. And, um, you know, I think that the, it's, life drives and dictates the quantity of time you have to spend with people, whether it's work. I mean, certainly I try to work less, but, um, you know, we're in a, we're in a position almost where we're, we're almost at the empty nester stage. Our youngest is 16 and our two are in college. And yeah. so there's uh there's more free time, you know, for us, but, uh, um, the, the quality of interaction, certainly, you know, it's been good. And, yeah. um, so I, I've got a, I've got a new, bucket list item which is i want to take my wife to hawaii every year for the rest of my life okay it's not a bad a one. year so yeah. you know life's gotta have gotta have some goals with as much as i travel having uh frequent flyer points and hotel points that seems achievable but it's making making sure like those things are our priority yeah 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 good priorities to have 
Yeah. Um, I want to finish up by um, coming back round to um, the work side of things. Um, and that is uh, more about career advice. So as you say, you're 50. Yep. So for somebody starting out um, here in 2019, 2020, what would be your advice for someone getting into finance, accounting, internal controls, like your subject area, people who have interest in this, what, what, uh, what would be your advice to them starting out? Well, it's interesting because I just gave that advice to somebody last night and it happens okay. to be my young, my middle daughter, right. um, who is an accounting major. Um, so she is a junior at CU Boulder and, uh, she's going to be great. She's gonna be a great resource for somebody at some point. I'm, and I'm not biased at all <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> as her father, but, um, you know, I think, for anybody, I think diversity of, uh, of experiences is really important. Um, I think that's, I would say, probably particularly um, something at the high level, high end of the millennials that yeah. are coming to the workforce right now um, is, uh, is, I would say, for companies to offer them um, different, uh, different opportunities to learn things, you know, so like rotating, um, rotating uh, options in different departments. Um, yeah. and, and I think uh, for um, people coming out of college, I always say the best, the, the career fields that are going to be stable. I'm talking from a U.S. perspective is um, accounting, IT, and then a medical facility. You know, we can count on those things always be here. You can't outsource yeah. some aspects of all those. I mean, there's certainly some some outsources of accounting and, and, and IT, but there's always going to be a need for resources. Um, so, um, what I would suggest to people is, you know, go big early on. I mean, I think I, 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 I went to work for one of the big four firms and don't regret that. So that's a good career path. Yeah. Um, and, and audit or, um, it, um, it audit in particular, um, and an it role, you know, consulting is always, is, is a good, you know, as a system integrator, as much as I say, there's flaws in the industry, you learn a lot. Yeah. Flaws in audit, there's a, you learn a lot, but, um, you know, I think the, the best thing is for people to have different, uh, either internships or, um, exposure and then go for as many certifications as you can, yeah. as you can afford. That's, that's the challenge. Yeah. Outside of, um, degrees, masters, that kind of thing. Is there a particular qualification that you look at and think, you know, that's a, that's really going to put you in a good position. Is there a particular qualification or certification? Um, outside of accounting, um, I like either the CISA or CISM. So right. I think the IT community or IT audit community, um, has a, there's a lot of, we talked about this, just a, the, the field's growing, it's changing, you know, the things that we're talking about today, like ransomware yeah. didn't exist five years ago, really for all intents and purposes. So there's some aspects of, uh, evolution of technology that people have to stay on top of. And, um, whether you're on the implementation side of that technology or the audit side, um, you're, you're doing, um, justification for organizations. So there's a lot of CASPs and anything on those areas, depending whether you're going internal or from an audit perspective, but, um, you know, there's good career paths, um, along the way for, for lots of different organizations and yeah. Yeah. You just, um, break down CISA and CISM for those who don't know the acronym. Yes. Um, certified information systems manager, certified information systems account or auditor. Sorry. Yeah. So it's in, basically like, like an inter, internal versus an external. Um, so on the IT audit side versus the IT side, um, you know, CISP, I'm not really the, the external, it's like pen testing kind of a guy that's, we we're really pr mostly focused on internal threats. So that's not an yeah. area that I like from an ISACA perspective, follow as much as I do, um, the CISA type role, the role of the IT auditor. Yeah. Um, but I think for organizations, so the ideal scenario in my mind is having somebody work in accounting for a while and then move into IT audit and having the ability to fill the gap between um, the, uh, the, the, the two, the business process knowledge, the accounting knowledge. And then, um, so I really like the CISA um, designation for that. Okay. Um, but uh, it depends on, you know, kind of where you're going in the industry in, in terms of uh, accounting, finance or whatever. There's a lot of different. A lot of different opportunities. CPA is always a great one, but it's just a little more of a challenge to get because you got to have a certain experience and yeah. work under a public account and that kind of thing. So yeah. yeah, yeah, okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining me, and um, thank you for taking this one a little bit more personal with your story. Yeah, no um, yeah. uh, just one th final thought on on a personal level uh, for those listening. 
Uh, any advice you would give about you know your uh, health, particularly around the heart that um, that you've kind of woken up to that other people should be thinking about? Because I'm I'm certainly thinking about it. <laughs> well, that's good, and that's uh, that's why I tell my story quite a bit, even though it's some sometimes it's uncomfortable and weird. Um, so I would invite people to connect with me on LinkedIn if they're interested in, in interacting with me a little bit more one on one about you know either my my health story or anything else. So um, Jeff Jeffrey Hare or Jeff Hare on LinkedIn, any yep. of risk advisors. I'm gonna change my profile recently to be Jeff Hare. So um, certainly happy to connect with people um, offline. Um, so I would say the number one advice I would give to people um, from a health perspective is just stay active. Okay. And um, as I was started looking at like the, the studies, like the first question I asked myself in this is how am I alive? You know, I mean, I understood some of this. I'm like, how possibly could I have survived? Uh, I was 99% blocked in the, in the widow maker for seven and a half days. <laughs> and you tell some people that like that and they're like, it's just not possible. Yeah. <laughs> and so I looked, I mean, I believe, I believe there are, there, are, there are such things as miracles in this world. Yeah. I'm a Christian and I believe that God does perform miracles, but there's a physiological reason that has to support that. I mean, yeah. he doesn't just, dead men don't come, come back to life, I guess, in some respects, you think of that. Yeah. Right. So I look for the physiological um, reason behind that and collateral arteries. And, and there's, there's only one study I found on collateral arteries in the world. And it talked about um, your activity level doesn't have to be significant in terms of um, intensity. Um, the one study it's out there and I can, I can pull it up if anybody's interested is eight to 10 hours a week of, uh, of raising your heart rate, 15 to 20 beats above your resting heart rate. Right. And so walking is just as good as, you know, weightlifting or exercise in the terms of that. And I think, um, you know, I mean, any doctor, any person is going to say, stay fit, eat well. Um, but yeah. make, make exercise a priority, find, find, find a dog or a spouse or a friend to do it with yeah. and just, um, try to get, you know, if it's only a half an hour a day, I'm a big fan of the Apple watch, you know, <laughs> what you, uh, my brother says what you can't, uh, measure, you can't improve. Yeah. Good phrase he has. And so, um, you know, just having something to, to track what you're doing is a good thing, whether you, you know, step goal or stand goal is important for sure. Um, so just stay active. That's the key. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks again for sharing your story. Um, I much appreciate it. And uh, again, you know, this one going a little bit more personal. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, is there anything else you want to finish with? No, I appreciate you, Lewis. You're a good guy. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, I tried to be. Yeah. I'm now going to go and do some exercise. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to hold I mean, you accountable for that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna get we're gonna get you on our team, and now now you're gonna be tracked and, and hounded by both myself and my brother Kevin. So okay, well, I'll let myself in for. What you asked for. Uh, yeah, I won't let my wife listen to this because she's saying I've been telling you this for years. Okay. Well, you need to do it with your wife. That's my advice. That's my <laughs> final final thought on that. Find a way to do it together. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, great talking to you. Sounds good. Cheers, brother. Right. Take care. Cheers.